Yep. Yeah, yeah, so let's let's make a start. So it's my pleasure to introduce Mathieu Gibert to give today's webinar. Um, coming from Grenoble, and he's going to talk to us about some exciting new experimental results. So Mathieu, when you're ready, please just take it away. I am. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much to give me the opportunity to share all these uh, results with all of you. Um, this is the first time I do it uh, via web, and I'm usually hand wavy and etc. So I'll try to do my best with the mouse, but uh, do not hesitate to ask questions. And uh, well, I don't know what is the if it's at the end or not. I don't know. My point, my point of view, I'm open for anything. So you. If you really want to, you can interrupt, uh, and it would be my pleasure to answer. So indeed, I'm going to talk about, uh, well, a new experiment, but an experiment that was built over the past 10 years. So uh, <laughs> it was a long, uh, long and difficult story, but uh, I'm pretty happy of the results that we got uh, in the past two years, I would say. And here the title is Direct Visualization of Quantum Vortices. A quantum vortex density law in rotating helium-4. But we will see a few other things. I start by some obvious things for you, for most of you probably. So I will go quick on, the, on those one. First off is why are we happy to play with this funny fluid, uh, which is called helium-2? Well, first off, because it has a very low viscosity and has a, a thermal conductivity that can be... Uh, considered as infinite. And in my point of view, the more interesting part is the existence of these quantum vortices, which looks like a normal vortex, but uh, with a, a few funny topics, which is that first, it has a very, very tiny core. And secondly, it ha uh, his, the circulation of the velocity field around it is quantized. And we will see that it has a funny, uh, implication and then it uh, generates a funny hydrodynamics and this is for me the the object that I'd like to study as much as precisely as I can so one another thing is that uh, there is not only one model for uh, helium 2 and this is also uh, something which is I think nice because that means we have work we have we in the term of community have a work uh, which is to probably in the next few years and uh, make uh, work hard enough to get a, a unified version of it, of, uh, of what, we, what we call helium-2. But one of the most common uh, model uh, that we are used to uh, use is the two-fluid model. And I'd like to introduce it without, uh, intro without equation. And by saying that, uh, well, at high temperature, high temperature meaning above 2.17 Kelvin, we have a normal fluid that obeys uh, a, a Navier-Stokes equation. At very, very low temperature, we have a super fluid, the perfect fluid that obeys an Euler equation. And in between, we have a superposition of both of these fluids. And the way they interact is, again, this very funny um, object called quantum vortex. Uh, this leads me to introduce uh, uh, what I like to, uh, to, to describe to hydro, hydrodynamicists as the superfluid wind tunnel. Wind tunnel in the sense that in the classical uh, fluids, the wind tunnel is like the main experiment, the one that has been used forever and that is still used and useful. Uh, well, in superfluid flows, in helium-2 flows, we have the thermal contour flow. Uh, so uh, let me introduce it in a few seconds. Uh, here, let's imagine that this slide is flooded by helium-2 and that inside this helium-2, we introduce a channel that is blocked on one side and open to the flow on the other side and that we have a heater uh, at the bottom part, bottom here. And if I switch on this heater, what happens is that the normal fluid flows out of the pipe because it carries heat. And by mass conservation, the, the superfluid will enter uh, this pipe. This maximizes the velocity difference between those two components. And therefore, it generates a vortex tangle. 
uh, this vortex tangle can be characterized by a single dist distance, characteristic distance called delta in my talk, that is the intervortex spacings. So this is a very classical experiment. Now, experimentally, how do we probe this kind of flow or even uh, more generally helium-2 flows? Well, there are, I think, two classes of, uh, of measurements. One, one which can be done with Hollerian sensors. What does it mean? It means that we put in the middle or somewhere in this flow at a fixed position, a sensor, and the sensor will tell us what it sense. But first off, the question is, what, what will it sense? Will it sense superfluid, the superfluid component? Will it sense the normal fluid component? Well, these are complicated questions that I will not talk about today. I just wanted to advertise uh, two relatively recent publications that has been done in the Schreck collaboration, uh, where we describe a measurement with hot wires, which are quite uh, rare in superfluid because you need the um, uh, it's a helium-2 under pressure, and a uh, second one, which is done with cantilevers. This is not done at all in such a configuration. It's done in the Schreck experiment, which is a monster experiment, okay, a huge one common flow of one meter in diameter and a bit more of one meter in height. But in terms of sensor, I think it's interesting. The second kind of sensor are Lagrangian particles or Lagrangian sensors, and in, I will reduce it to Lagrangian particles. That means what? That means you throw a bunch of particles in your flow and you look at them, the way uh, they move uh, in, uh, in this flow, in this helium-2 flow. The question will be as complex. Uh, what does drive the motion of this particle is a complex question, and I think we still have uh, lots of work to do on that. But this, this was my way of introducing uh, how to sense experimentally uh, helium-2. And I would like to start this presentation with something which is not exactly in the title, but which is exactly what I described uh, before, an experiment that we done, we've done in collaboration in Prague and in collaboration with uh, Marco Lamontia and Patrick uh, that I saw among the people listening, which is the, who is the first author of this paper. Uh, and where we did exactly what I described, well, uh, such a such a channel, okay, which is twenty five cent millimeter in cross section here and ten centimeters in height, with a heater at the bottom, and then you you throw particles uh, in this channel and you switch on your heater and you have your flow. In that case, it was deuterium particles, and we see that we collected the. Uh, lots of movies at relatively high frame rates. And uh, well, if you look at these particles and if you know a bit of uh, turbulence at this high frame rate, it's hard to see that it's turbulent, but it, 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 it looks like turbulent flow. But if you look at it more closely, and if my computer is okay to switch slide, yes you realize that these particles have funny trajectories. Look at this one in particular. Here it goes fast, here it slows down, here it goes fast, and then et cetera, et cetera. So the very same particle can have different behavior along its travel uh, out of the channel, let's say. And this was true for many, I mean, this is true for many trajectories. And uh, this is uh, characterized, let's say, by a bimodal uh, velocity distribution. This was already observed uh, in other experiments, um, but still I wanted to show it and to show up in the next slide, something that I think was uh, quite interesting is that if you look at the velocity distribution of this, of all these particles, okay, of all the trajectories that we've collected. So in a, in a 2D fashion, okay, here you have the horizontal velocity, here you have the vertical velocity. In color, here is the probability density function of finding this velocity. And you can see that there is like two regimes. Uh, one which is at relatively slow velocity that could be associated with trapped particles whose motion is uh, disturbed by something. And this something is most likely quantum vortices, which are present in this uh, pipe, 
not too long. And here, a second peak at relatively high velocity that corresponds fairly well to uh, the what we expect to be the normal fluid velocity with the imposed heating that we used at uh, well for this particular experiment. On top of that, we have added uh, in this, uh, let's say, phase space, the uh, acceleration, so the red arrows are the accelerations condition on the x and the y. So that means if you sit on this position, it gives you a certain uh, horizontal velocity, it gives you a certain vertical velocity. And here, for this uh, beam, let's say, we have averaged the acceleration of the particles. And this reveals um, some sort of a travel into this phase space, which shows you that you can move from a trapped space, a trapped state to a free, uh, free particle state if you can accelerate in straight lines. And then you will eventually fall from this free particle state to the trapped one uh, by acceleration, which are bended towards uh, down, uh, down. So this is here where my hands are usually useful to explain. <laughs> but uh, this means basically that you are, uh, well, that the particle trajectory is annoyed, let's say, by something. But this something is probably quantum vortices, but we didn't really saw them. And the question is, where are they? Where are they? And I keep this question in French to teach you a little bit of French here, sorry. Well, they are hidden most likely by the turbulence. So let's simplify the problem. Let's simplify the problem by having a look at a rotating fluid. If we take a classical fluid, everybody in the audience knows what happened. Uh, after some time, which we will not consider here, uh, the entire fluid goes in sol under solid body rotation together with this container. You have this nice parabola surface, which is a nice exercise, a physicist uh, school, let's say. And we definitely know exactly what is the velocity field here is uh, omega, the, the velocity speed, uh, rotational velocity, sorry, uh, times r, uh, the distance to the, to the center of the container. What happens if you do that with helium-2? Well, if you look at it from far away, from far enough, let's say, it's uh, exactly the same story. Not very interesting, but still it is, because if you look at it closer, what happens is that uh, the quantum vortices will have to uh, arrange themselves in a regular shape, in a regular fashion, uh, almost like a crystal, if you look at it from the top. Uh, that is totally equivalent to what is called the Mabrikozov lattice in uh, sub superconductivity. This quantum vortex lattice is characterized here again by the intervortex distance delta that here is very, very easy to describe. It's the, the let's say, the characteristic length scale of this uh, crystal quantum, yeah, it's of this quantum vortex crystal. Now, if you want to relate both of these situations here, we can do it by computing the circulation of the velocity field in both of these cases. So on, we take a contour, okay, which is defined here, and we compute the velocity, uh, the, the, the circulation uh, along this contour. So in the classical fluid, uh, spinning fluid is fairly easy. You have two pi r, the circumference of this, uh, of this circle, uh, times directly the velocity since it is collinear with e theta. In that case, if you take the same contour, well, you can compute this uh, circulation in a different fashion uh, using Stokes theorem. I'm sure it's uh, this name in English, but uh, well, fairly, and I'm sure you know about it. And you have to in, uh, count the number of vortices crossing the surface that is, that is defined by this contour. This is n vortex here, and you have to multiply it by the kappa, the quantum of circulation. It gives you this uh, simple expression, and now if you equate this and that, you get 
what is called in the community, I think, the Feynman's rule. This rule is very nice because it relates directly the inter vortex spacing to what? To the rotation frequency of your container and the quantum of circulation of vortices. It's, it's relatively low level rule, I would, I would say. It's a fundamental rule. And this is what we've been hunting for quite some time. So this has already been, of course, well, of course is a big word. Uh, this has been uh, measured experimentally, first by the historical, I would say, experiment uh, run by uh, Yamshuk uh, during his PhD, if I'm right, uh, in the group of Packard, where in the 80s, uh, they managed to get uh, these images, which are, uh, I think, extraordinary, extraordinary. So here you look at the rotating helium-2 from above, and you see that increasing the velocity speed, you get more and more vortices, and that they indeed respect this uh, idea of crystal uh, that we just uh, described. A few years later, quite a few years later, in fact, there was this also on the group paper by Greg Bule uh, in the group of Lasfop during his PhD 2006, where they showed well they showed this picture to us to all of us, and I think or at least in my case this this particular picture was the one that convinced me that this hydrogen particles because in that case they were throwing hydrogen particles into helium two uh, were indeed uh, tracking uh, quantum vortices. Uh, but I'd like to raise a few problems with that. If I'm not wrong, this study here uh, in the 80s is the result of about three PhDs. So it's a very long effort and very hard. And uh, in this paper, they did not uh, prove uh, this law. It stays a bit uh, qualitative, what they were showing, even if it was, of course, opening everything that, that I will show later. I mean, for me, it was a the paper very that gave me a lot of ideas, and Greg also, by the way, because I was doing a postdoc uh, just after his PhD, I, we were doing our postdoc in the same place in Göttingen, uh, so we talked a lot about all that. So this is why when I came back in France after this postdoc in Göttingen, uh, and I got the chance to have uh, enough money to launch a relatively big experiment, uh, this, we decided to build uh, a new cryostat that I baptized the Cryolem or cryogenic Lagrangian exploration module. And it looks like this. I will not bother you with a lot of details, but uh, I think it's also nice to see a real thing. So here you have a different picture. This is uh, where the container that contains the experimental helium. Here you have a liquid nitrogen shield, and this is the external part. Uh, well, we will come back on a few pieces of this uh, experiment, maybe a few orders of magnitude. Um, the heat losses, the total heat losses that falls on to the uh, internal part of the cryostat that is 100 milliwatts when you operate it uh, classically, which is quite nice, I would say. And yes, to make it simple, it's a complex aquarium. This is uh, what I like to... Uh, when, when, I, when I talk to hydrodynamicists uh, that plays usually with water or something like that, uh, told them it's, it's about the same, but it's a bit more complex to build and to operate. You see also that there is plenty of windows because the ambition from the beginning was to run 3D experiments. Uh, that means that by looking at the center of the, of the experiment, uh, by different angles, you can reconstruct in 3D uh, the trajectories of particles. This is something that uh, Greg, uh, Bule, and I learned uh, while being in postdoc with the Barbot and Chats. Uh, and this was, of course, something that uh, we had in mind uh, from day one. Uh, I will go quickly about how it works, because also I think it's interesting to know a bit how it works, these kind of things. So if you want to work on a certain day called D-Day here, uh, well, a few days earlier, you have to prepare your cryostat, make vacuum, inject a nitrogen into the nitrogen uh, reservoir, which is here in red. Uh, then 
uh, after one day like this, you inject a liquid uh, helium into the embedded uh, reservoir of liquid helium into the upper part of the cryostat. So this, is, this has to be seen for experimentalists as an uh, embedded uh, helium bottle. This will be used like that because the experimental cell is here and for now it's empty. And we will fill it uh, the same day, opening a cold valve, which is here, which is here, sorry. And this is the interest, I mean, the part where we will do experiments. So here you have the temperature as a function of time. Well, this is not very representative for now. But uh, this part is uh, when you do all this, when you see the temperature starts goes down and with lots of this uh, perturbation uh, while we do all this procedure. But well, it works. Then we close this cold valve and to have helium 2, well, we have to pump. Pumping experimentally is, uh, well, the idea, I will not. Uh, a long time on it is to travel along the liquid vapor uh, equilibrium uh, line here and to fall into the helium 2 uh, region. Okay, so to do that, we have a complex uh, pumping line to allow for a very, let's say, accurate uh, and control over the temperature because then when you control the pressure, you can also control the temperature. And I wanted to show you a picture of uh, the new room of this uh, new experiment, of uh, this experiment, because we had to move in the last year. And uh, well, I think it's a quite nice installation, how it looks in real. Uh, the schematic are uh, small, but uh, when you look at it uh, in real, uh, it's quite nice. So you have different uh, pumping lines which, with automatic valve, which uh, we pilot and allows us to uh, control the, the pressure and then the temperature very nicely. This is on the side of the cryostat, and this is the control room. The control room that you see here, you will find again all these uh, pipes, and then, uh, well, this is a control screen, and here it's a, a, the place where we control everything by touching all these buttons. And this is uh, all this is operational. This control box is for something that we will see in a few slides. And up there, up there, you stock the PhD students. I don't know if Charles is listening. I hope he is. And he's uh, probably like here right now. Now we can pump. So we transform this helium and only this one into helium 2. This one is not affected. And here we get a very nice temperature stability. We inject particles that you see here. We do our experiments, then some of the helium 2 evaporates. And at the end of the day, we let it go back to helium 1. And during the night, we let this part evaporate outside, in fact, because we don't want to throw uh, hydrogen or deuterium to the liquefier. Uh, and then when we come back, let's say in the morning, this reservoir has uh, gone down, but we are in the same state uh, as, uh, I mean, we are ready, we are quickly ready to start again. What is important on all that, despite the fact that it's interesting to learn a bit how it works experimentally, is uh, what I wanted to show is that every day we start with a fresh uh, experimental um, chamber. So all the particles that we've made uh, on the, um, yesterday, let's say, has have disappeared, and so we can start uh, we can start fresh. The experimental cell is clean, and this allowed us to make uh, to make. Uh, to make a lot of tries to uh, well to understand what uh, how to work uh, how is the particle generation working even if we still have work what is kind of interesting also with this experiment is that it is fully it's mounted on a spinning table i hope the movie is working and that you see that this cryostat which is about three meter high and 1.5 meter in uh, width uh, everything spins okay so to make it spin, we make it levitate first off uh, on an air cushion of uh, 50 micron width, which is at this level here. So this is to limit uh, friction, this is to limit vibration, and this is very efficient, very nice. It can spin up to 120 RPM, which is two hertz. And uh, as I mentioned here, it's scary when it, do, when it spins at two hertz. 
to be honest, we've never made the cryostat. I mean, loaded like this, spin that fast. Uh, the table alone uh, spinning at two hertz is scary. So uh, with the cryostat, I mean, maybe we will do that, but uh, we need uh, some more experiments before. <laughs> Everything, of course, uh, because of this rotation is uh, remote control and data logged because, uh, well, you don't want uh, to sit on that, on that table when, uh, when you do experiments. Uh, well, this, there is a lot of technical tricks that I don't have to, that I can, I have no time to describe, but I wa wanted to stress, for instance, that here there is a part that is not moving. I don't know if you can see it clearly or not. Uh, up, up here it's moving, down here it's moving, but exactly where my mouse is right now, it's not moving. And this is the pumping line, which is, which, is, uh, which allows us that uh, the big pump is not on the spinning table. And this was designed in house and this is the tight. Uh, all this requires a precise alignment, which uh, relies also on the world. Here you can see, the guy who helped me a lot with this uh, design, and which I cannot thank enough for his help on all this project. Thank you. Um, why doesn't want to go? Okay, but it's uh, it's not totally over. So just a few more pictures when it works. So on this table and spinning with the experiment, there is a laser, uh, which allows us to make the visualization. There are cameras, there are computers, uh, electronics, uh, everything you need, and it's spinning and compatible with rotation. But also we have uh, built a particle generation uh, technology, let's say, which is in two, in two, um, two components. One which is in the lab and fixed, uh, fixed in the lab. That is uh, and here we wanted to show you the the back uh, back of the story, which everything is remote controlled uh, and here again. So basically, when we generate particles, we said okay, we want a such fraction of hydrogen or deuterium or anything you want in the middle, and you click go, and all these uh, electronic valves will open and close the way it needs to be. Control this pump here, etc. And there is a part of this which is on the spinning table. Uh, on this view, you cannot see it, it's on the other side, but uh, there is this system here, which allows to inject the particles uh, as we are uh, spinning. So the way we do particles is uh, not very different or not at all different from what uh, Greg Bule was doing uh, back uh, during his PhD. So it's a mixture of 1.5% uh, of the hydrogen uh, at room temperature, okay, with 98.5% uh, of uh, helium gas. Um, and then uh, we inject directly this mixture into the into helium-2. Uh, maybe one difference is that we control uh, very finely um, the injection pressure and, and therefore the, the flow rate of the injection, uh, thanks to this uh, uh, pressure-reducing value. Okay, let's, let's describe the experiment uh, more precisely. Now, uh, it's not very different than what we saw earlier. In fact, there is a channel inside the... So this is the, the chamber that you've seen earlier. Uh, and in the middle, we've put a, well, a channel that is uh, two by two centimeter and 10 centimeter high. This pipe here is the... that ends about here indeed is the particle injection uh, pipe, let's say. Then we have a laser sheet that uh, goes through and through the cryostat, through the mini windows and et cetera, and that allows us to look uh, perpendicularly to it uh, using uh, cameras, different cameras. This gives you the scales, okay. And then at the end of the day, what we want to look at, what we hope to look at, is uh, well this uh, the vortex lattice that I showed you uh, and that is represented uh, here uh, with this uh, white rods which is okay just uh, to make a nice uh, design and uh, well here uh, this is in fact uh, real experimental data but we will see that 
right away, I just remind you here uh, previous uh, visualization, experimental visualization of this lattice. And this was our first results, and we were quite happy with that. So here you see there is a um, 2 RPM, 6 RPM, 10 RPM, 16 RPM. And uh, I hope you are uh, you agree with me that uh, on these pictures you can see vertical lines, and that the faster you spin, uh, the clo um, the closest the closer they are. So this was the very beginning. Uh, we took our ruler and uh, measured this distance uh, very simply uh, initially, and. Uh, and we got these experimental points with relatively high uh, uh, error bars. But uh, then we just uh, uh, plot the Feynman rules on it. And uh, we got this line, and we were relatively happy. We see that we have done better. Just I forgot to mention that at the bottom of this channel, we also have a heater. And we see that it becomes important uh, after a few, in a few slides. Uh, this slide also served me to show you the stability of this network. So this is a case, uh, I think it's a 10 RPM case. So I hope you see nicely the, the this interval text distance. And uh, this movie, I think, is four times faster than uh, in reality. Um, and you see that you clearly see the, the, the lattice, no problem whatsoever. Um, and you also see a, a certain vibration of the entire image, OK? And this is a technical issue, I would say, uh, which is that the, the inner container that contains the helium uh, that we work with uh, has a very tiny uh, oscillation of, uh, of order 50 microns in amplitude. That's because uh, is uh, is attached in the cryostat in the upper part, like uh, more than one meter above uh, where we are looking, and therefore, uh, if there is a misalignment of about uh, one two micron up there, this leads to uh, fifty microns here, and uh, well, this is what we see. So the entire container has a um, has a small uh, waving motion that you can see in this movie, but OK, uh, think of it as uh, this is the, the entire container that, uh, that oscillates. And the camera is not. So this is why you see uh, this motion here. But you can also appreciate the stability of this network. Um, then we went kind of crazy and made a lot and a lot and a lot and a lot of experiments. and. Uh, this led us to this curve, which is a bit more precise, uh, mostly because we have acquired uh, something like 50,000 images uh, that we have um, analyzed using a wavelet, uh, well, which is in particular a GABA wavelet, uh, which allowed us to measure uh, on each one of our images uh, the, the interval text spacing, I would say, or at least the, the, the interval text spacing tracked by our particles. So this allowed us to uh, have uh, error bars and our measurements, and uh, also to figure that uh, everything was not as perfect as we as uh, we thought, because the let's say the pure <laughs> uh, Feynman rule is this uh, plain line here. And uh, okay, okay, uh, but this line is obtained if you um, if your laser sheet, which here is in blue, uh, is crossing the network uh, perf perfectly, like I showed here in this blue uh, this blue line, because in in this blue region. But if you cross the network with a certain angle, which is if you assume uh, an hexagonal lattice of uh, pi over six, well, it can happen that uh, you, in fact, are scanning with these images uh, two, um, well, two lines, I would say, or two, well, the network in a different way. And this gives you 
uh, this dashed line here, which corresponds maybe a bit better with our experiments. Uh, well, so the fact that there is a depth here is uh, due, in our case, to the fact that the depth of field of uh, our measurement is not uh, is not zero. In fact, you can see by the way here that there are some particles which are well in focus and some others which are not. Most likely, those uh, blurry zones here are probably due to uh, what is behind. Okay, another line of particles that is behind. Uh, the one that is in focus here. So we were very happy about that. And I remind you that here there was a heater. So we decided that maybe it was a good idea to play with this uh, with this network. And uh, instead of, uh, well, not using it, we used a, a heat, uh, well, we imposed a heat flux uh, with a certain frequency called sigma zero here, and we managed to uh, well to launch uh, waves on this network. So we called it dancing quantum bodies. Uh, here it's a movie which is again accelerated uh, by a factor of four to reality, I think. Uh, and here you have uh, a spatial time uh, diagram. So that means that uh, this figure here is um, a line of this movie, let's say this one, uh, that we plot over time, okay? So before this uh, dot line, the heater is off and we can see the oscillation of the container as I was telling you earlier. Uh, with what well, you can guess its amplitude. I think it will fit uh, nicely with 15 micron. And we have a more precise way of measuring that. Uh, and when you cross this dot line, this dashed line, sorry, the heater is on, and then you see that the particles uh, start to oscillate, okay? On a single line. Well, this is, uh, this is waves. I think we can call it waves. And more, um, I, can, I can add something which is probably a bit of overinterpretation, but it's also nice to see if you look at this particular zone here, for example, you see that the particles are here very well in focus, then they are out of focus for some time, and then they come back in focus. This give a hint, I think, that the particles move back and forth also with respect to the camera, which is maybe what you expect when thinking of a, a trajectory. Well, if you think of um, Kelvin wave, for example, but also in natural wave at this structure, that is a helix, okay? The, the, the vortices should be formed as a helix. So that is quite uh, interesting to see. I think that uh, we, we most likely have the trace of this here too, okay? And you can see it in different places, okay? Here it's in focus, out of focus, and it comes back a bit, and etc. So this, uh, okay, this is something that we have to study in the, uh, quickly. Oops, sorry, I left a few French words over there. But uh, here, uh, here is, uh, for example, uh, the dispersion relation that you can hope uh, from um, vortices in a, in a perfect fluid quantum vortices in, in perfect fluid. Uh, this relation is, um, dispersion relation is quite complex, okay, because it has, it combines three pos possible waves. First of all, you have inertial waves, uh, which happens also in classical fluids, and which uh, show this dispersion relation. Then you have Kelvin waves, which corresponds to uh, a, a vortex alone in the universe, if I, I want to say it like that, which is, is per perturbed. Okay, uh, and which has this helical structure that I was talking about. And then you have also Tsachenko wave, I'm not sure I played it correctly, sorry about that, uh, which corresponds to waves that you expect of a vortex that is embedded in a, in a vortex lattice, which is the case here in our experiment, but which was also observed in uh, coal atoms. Uh, here we have a picture and a, and a reference. So in order to, well, we started to work on this. Uh, this is only preliminary study, but I'm happy to share it, share it with you uh, using PIV. This was our first uh, tool. 
So here you see a velocity field. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not staying long on this. I just want to focus on the result. But just to show you that we, uh, well, we can we can work on that on these images. So we have PIV. Now we also um, Lagrangian tracks, and we are actually tracking uh, the lines of over time, the lines of particles. Uh, and we hope to have uh, quantitative results pretty soon. Uh, what we have observed during this preliminary study, so first off, also I wanted to mention a, a colleague of mine that uh, integrated our study because he's uh, an expert in uh, inertial waves, Pierre-Philippe Corté in Paris. Uh, what we found out uh, is uh, that uh, it seems that the amplitude of the motion of the, of the vortices is maximal, so there is a resonance when uh, the excitation uh, is uh, at the frequency of the spinning table. Uh, it also seems that the horizontal wavelength is kind of fixed, whatever we do, well, in a certain regime, and almost equal to the width of the channel. Okay, this uh, this can be understood as a or a certain wave, wave as kind of a waveguide in this direction. Well, boundary condition fi can, could fix this. And in the vertical direction, the wavelength in the vertical direction varies with uh, with the excitation. And uh, well, for now we are probing a few relations that which are uh, uh, well, which are directly related to inertial waves. But uh, I think we can go a lot further now to make more experiments. Uh, and before ending this uh, presentation. I wanted to show you also that, uh, well, if instead of uh, having a, heat, a heater which is uh, controlled uh, with, a sine, uh, with a nice sine, sine wave, uh, and if you use, uh, well, a strong, uh, <laughs> a strong heat flux, you see that I'm very precise here, heat flux is uh, big, well, we can trigger, uh, well, we can start from a state which is well known, okay, the, the vortex lattice, and trigger when we want, when we apply this heat flux, uh, lots of reconnection. Uh, well, this is not to you that I will learn that uh, this uh, reconnection plays a key role in this dissipation key scheme of, uh, of helium-2, of superfluids. Uh, and they are particularly interesting in turbulent flows. Um, and this is why we're going to go there too, of course. Uh, and before, and just I wanted to show you that, uh, well, we are able to generate this reconnection on a very, very uh, large scale. Uh, so here, I, I also confess to you that it's not easy to identify on this movie uh, not, uh, single reconnection events, but there are plenty, as for sure. Uh, and most likely with a nicer camera that is hopefully coming soon, uh, we will be able to uh, resolve uh, this dynamic uh, nicely. Uh, so here on this slide, you've seen lots of reconnection, I hope. Uh, which are, in fact, if you look at the literature, I mean, they are, of course, quantum vortex reconnection have been uh, studied, uh, starting by uh, in, the, in the PhD of Greg. I think there were already a few, or at least for the, the PhD that were coming just after him. Uh, but here there are really plenty, and most interestingly, I think we start uh, from a well-known and controlled initial condition, and we can trigger when and why do this reconnection happens. So hopefully, uh, we will be able to um, bring some uh, more uh, experimental results on this uh, question. Well, to conclude, uh, we have uh, scanned uh, quite a few, uh, quite a few uh, regimes of this uh, of this particular helium two uh, under rotation. We've shown that we have well, we have shown the basic state, which is the abacus of lattice. We've shown that we can have uh, in a stable state or in a stationary state at least uh, waves, and also that we can trigger. Uh, reconnection uh, at will. We need to explore um, 
quantitatively the frontiers between all these regimes to check uh, the theories uh, that are around. Uh, so it's a, it's a fairly big uh, phase space in that case. Okay, so we have uh, the rotation uh, the rotation speed of the cryostat. We have the heat flux, which corresponds uh, to the normal uh, fluid velocity. And uh, we also have temperature. I didn't mention the temperature on the entire, for the entire talk, but uh, now I can tell you that all, everything that you've seen is fairly close to um, the lambda point, okay, just below it. Uh, well, uh, why? It's just because this is where we worked <laughs> initially, and we still need to explore uh, not down to zero i'm not crazy enough <laughs> but uh, at least a, a few more uh, a few more temperatures here uh, and then we need to as i told you explore uh, the, the the separation between those regimes so that means uh, this we already know by the way that uh, to go from the stable network to the waves uh, we need to I mean, there is a threshold uh, in terms of uh, heat flux uh, below which nothing happens. And uh, from this state, let's say, to a reconnection state, uh, we need also to conquer uh, the, the heat power. Uh, of course, uh, the idea is to go toward a more uh, accurate description of uh, this kind of flow where you see the quantum process is more accurate when I, uh, I compare that to, uh, sorry, to the two fluid models that I introduced at the, at the, uh, at the very beginning of this talk. Uh, in the two fluid model, there is, I mean, a single vortex is not considered. I mean, it's not, uh, you have to consider a, a, an element of volume that, uh, that has uh, more than one vortex in it. Uh, so there are uh, these type of models that, uh, in, that well, quantify the friction between normal fluid and uh, vortices. Um, that we want to address uh, pretty soon. Let's say. We have to travel within this uh, very big uh, phase space. And before finishing, I wanted to thank uh, the heroes of this story and uh, conclude that we have a lot uh, of work to do. Uh, Emmerich, who did his PhD and ended, that ended in 2020, uh, Jeremy, who did the postdoc, uh, and uh, who was there when uh, the revolution happens. And Charles, who started his PhD relatively so, uh, not long ago. And well, these guys uh, have evolved also. So Emmerich uh, went to the private sector. Uh, Jeremy went to, uh, let's say, uh, T equals zero. That means he's working on dilution fridge uh, that are hopefully going to fly in satellites one day. And uh, therefore, Charles has a work that tends to infinity for the next few years. And with this, I conclude uh, my, uh, my, my webinar, sorry. And I'm happy to answer questions if you have. If you have. So. Thanks very much for a very interesting talk and for lifting the veil on uh, the sort of experimental details and what it takes to get this thing up and running and the preparation that's required. So questions, please either just unmute yourself or feel free to pop it in the chat if your connection is not great and I can ask the question on, on your behalf. Could I ask a question? I... Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, I, I'd like to ask a question about the Tkachenko waves. Yeah, Ura. Yes. So, so you mentioned that you know it's a crystal and that there is a there are like uh, phonons you know roughly speaking uh, of, of of this of this lattice. So do you have an idea how to excite them in your experiment? I'm not. Uh, no, I, this this is a tough question. Um, what I expect is that uh, they will come. Well, I can, I, you, do you see my face? Do you see my? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is, for instance, the few calculation that was. Ah, yeah, but okay. Anyway, we are. This is a question that is really very actual, and you need to play with this uh, um, dispersion relation. And what I do expect is that this term will uh, comes into play at high uh, uh, rotation speed. Um, this is all I can tell you now. Uh, I have to say. 
but doesn't it also mean on like my understanding is that you excite these modes by your heater right is it correct yes yes so can you change the geometry of such a heater like such that it's not like down but like going through your yes it's really like it's like a real experiment like ver vertical uh, like you know you know vertically some kind of heater which will push on all these vortices yes it is it is doable and actually we probably will uh, implement that in the next uh, next time we use because i think in that case maybe you can excite uh, excite kachenko waves okay but uh, th there is something which is called in this context ruderman mode i, I guess you maybe you, you've heard about it it's it's like the lowest uh, mode of Tkachenka in a cylindrical geometry you know somehow if you have a bucket and you have a finite uh, so 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 you know uh, the mode is essentially transverse so it, it's doing something something like that I see you yeah. and if you have a like a perturbation which would want to do this to your crystal then you would predominantly excite this mode and this mode is it's known what frequency it has so so maybe you know uh, one okay. can so then i with... mean to excite such a mode uh, then we probably we also have another tool i think mm. uh, on the on the on the top of the i think i have nothing to show it but uh, let's say uh, from the top of the cell i am able to come down with a um, with anything mm. uh, that can spin or move up and down mm -hmm. okay and for now uh well for these runs we had a what we call a pin which is a small drill mm -hmm. the idea was to was to bring um, a pinning point to the to the vortices mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we are now thinking of uh, introducing there something more complex that can probably uh, play the role of exciting uh, mm -hmm. what like you like you showed me like this but mm -hmm. i will be happy to discuss more of this yeah. Yeah. no in fact to be honest i didn't know about the ruderman mode yeah it's called ruderman mode but yeah. anyway thanks a lot for interesting talk it's i think it's very beautiful experiment thank you so next up was patrick i think who had his hand up first hi matthew thank you thank you for the talk uh I'm just interesting. Uh, so you say that you see these collective modes uh, when your uh, modulation frequency is the same as the spinning frequency. Do you have yeah. any explanation for that? Not really. Not really. For me, it's not clear yet. Uh, and I've, well, first of all, we want it to be, to be more uh, precise uh, for now, it's more a feeling. Uh, no, it's not a feeling. It's clearly visible, but uh, I want it to be um, more quantitative. Uh, let's say to let's say plot this resonance uh, like a resonance curve. I can show you. I when we are very we are that close to have this curve, which would be let's say the amplitude or let's say for example the horizontal amplitude of the motion of the vortex as a function of sigma zero. Or uh, now we work, let's say, more in terms of um, sigma star, which is defined in that slide here. So that is uh, sigma zero divided by two omega. Uh, and we are, as we speak, uh, plotting this. And uh, I wanted to have this curve in order to discuss more about that. For now, I don't have a clear explanation. If you have one, uh, I'm very happy. I will, I will think about it. Thank you. My pleasure. I think there is another question. Yeah, so next up, sorry, I was just dealing with a question in the chat. Uh, next up, Eagle. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, <clears throat> it's very interesting. Talk, talk thank you. Uh, thank you. When you were saying in the beginning that the uh, this geometrical factor that uh, delta, which is uh, distance between uh, cores, is square root of uh yes yes uh you said that it's not working always uh you mean 
in the very beginning, you said that it's not uh, working always. Or are we talking about uh, the, the, the Feynman rule? What are we talking about? Geometry. That uh, sigma is square root of uh, 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 quantum divided by uh, rotation velocity. Two omega. Uh, no, no, it, no, no. Sorry, maybe I did. I did. A, I said a mistake. Um, well, I, well, I said it wrong. What I want, maybe, if we want to discuss something uh, about this, is if you assume, if you assume a certain um, geometry for the crystal uh then it can be there can be tiny differences uh for this factor here so uh, it, if you assume that this is a perfect uh, triangular lattice or hexagonal lattice this two becomes a square root of three if i'm yes i think uh, which is not uh, a huge difference in the story but uh um, yes, sure. yes. this is all i this is all i can think of yes Okay, then uh, uh, about the uh, background or kind of noise that uh, we all know that uh, if you have superfluid helium, you always have uh, some vorticity there without any rotation and the heat flux, right? You have, sorry? If you have superfluid helium, you always have some uh, vorticity in there because uh, energy to create a vortex in helium-4 superfluid is very low. So you always have some kind of background of uh, like not polarized, uh, yes, uh, vortices. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. How yeah. you get rid of uh, this in your... Uh, this cannot, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think this... Uh... <laughs> This movie here is quite convincing that if there is a background, and I, I agree with you, there should be one. It's not strong enough to disturb the path, the, 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 the lattice, no? Yes, but if uh, you uh, show the uh, 10 RPM and 16 per rotation per minute, uh, I don't see the big difference. Yes. It's, uh, it's tough to see with eyes, I agree. And this is also quite natural because you enter into a zone which where the delta evolves very, very, very few, okay, very little. So it's normal that you don't see uh, a huge difference between the, the in the intervortex distance. Um, what I can tell you is, of course, when we inject the particles, when we inject the particles, since we inject a gas which is uh, at room temperature, very warm, um, well, it disturbs it disturbs strongly, strongly uh, what you what you see uh, what you see on the camera. Uh, but after a few seconds um, or a few minutes, maybe more uh, more accurate to say a few minutes, um, all this perturbation disappeared from uh, from the visible uh, from what we can see. And uh, we get uh, this nice pattern. Yes. Here. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? In my point of view, it's okay. Maybe. But yes, I uh, uh, have you yeah, ever yeah. seen a vortex free state of the superfluid helium? I didn't get the beginning. Have you ever seen a vortex free? Uh, uh, ah, yeah. Vortex free? Free? No vortex. No vortex. Uh, no vortex. Uh, difficult to say. Uh, no. Uh, what I can tell you is uh, no. I will. I will say no. I never see, so no vortex when we spin. Okay. When okay. We, uh, Thank you. What I can tell you is that it's uh, the the point which is here. Okay, at one rpm, uh, is has a huge <laughs> error bar because. Uh, to be honest, we have uh, for the other movies, for the other configuration, we have lots of movies. For this one, uh, it was very, very hard to get uh, something stable enough uh, where we see uh, nicely the the pattern. We have a couple of movies there. Uh, so I think it's fair to say that, well, the, 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 the closest we are to omega equals zero, the 
the the the more uh, the perturbation are important. Uh, the perturbation you were talking about in your first question, I think. Yeah, thank you. The, that's probably just a consequence of just visualizing in in two D in a plane, right? That just also that know. also that indeed it's much harder to catch it uh, in our um, visualization. Yeah, box way. Hi, Matthew. Uh, very Hi. nice work. Thank you very much. Um, I want to know what's the thickness of your laser sheet. Huge. Uh, for now, the laser sheet is um, it depends how you define it, but I would give you a one millimeter. But thickness one millimeter. Yes, but uh, what limits here the, um, the, the 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 what we see on the image is not the laser the laser thickness, but the the depth of field. Of the objective, okay. We use uh, we uh, by playing with the aperture, we have uh, we have a good estimate of our depth of field uh, where the particles are in focus, which is of about uh, one hundred fifty micron. I think we, which corresponds to what we can calculate given the optics uh, characteristics and uh, and what we observe. So that means the effective thickness of the imaging plane is smaller than the line space in your experiment. Well, I guess in this case, uh, you, as you as you explained, that there's uncertainty, which is uh, where exactly your laser or imaging plane passes through the vortex array. Exactly. So, have you ever tried to uh, scan the position? of your laser sheet so you can yes. put a so this electronic is, uh, translation stage uh, move the laser sheet back and forth yes i'm very uh, well uh, hopefully you'll be you, you'll be a referee of uh, my project uh, that i sent to the french <laughs> to the french uh, funding agency this is exactly what uh, where we're going so uh, tomorrow uh, for i mean concerning this uh, the simple case of uh, the fixed lattice uh, so first off, tomorrow uh, of Friday, sorry, I, I will work uh, with some experts uh, as, uh, on uh, making the the laser sheet much uh, thinner, comparable to what you use in your work. I know you are uh, used to work with a hundred micron, something like that, uh, thickness of the laser. So we're gonna try to do this. I have the optics. You see, I just received a tall labs packet. I know you don't see it, but it's just here. And um, and this is one thing. And the second thing is to use indeed um, a scanning mirror or a tilting mirror to scan through. And the idea, of the, one of the idea in this project is to, uh, well, exactly what you suggested, scan this lattice. And hopefully, well, I, I'm, I hope also that I will be able to do it quick enough, fast enough, uh, to be able to synchronize that with the fast camera and having uh, some sort of a 3D measurement like this. If, if you I see. Uh, very good, very good. Uh, one last uh, minor suggestion is you, you may consider in your future experiment uh, to regulate rotation. Regulate rotation. You, you know, yes. you, you have constant rotation speed, but you can probably add to that some... Uh, uh, sunny sort of uh, wave you, you, or whatever you know to to, to excite collective motion. You have already read my proposal, ah. no? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> so, so indeed, this is another another direction. Uh, the idea is to I mean, one of, again, one of the idea is to uh, yeah, well, again, exactly as you say, having and this is possible with the spinning table that we have. Uh, to control, I mean, to have a spinning frequency, which is a sign, okay, and uh, to try to, I mean, the idea is to observe the way the system reacts uh, yeah. to this sign, and uh, then again, you can do it uh, like a spectrum, okay, make, make a response function, I would say, of the system to this modulation, and this is indeed uh, one of our, of our goals. Very good, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the suggestion. Thank you for your question. So just before 
Dima asked his question, just to, I'll draw people's attention to the chat where Charles, um, Matthew's colleague, has added a clarification as well about just the difficulty of visualising vortices at the very low rotation rates. Um, so Charles is the PhD, okay, is first author on this. <laughs> so, Dima. Yeah. Thanks, Matthew. Also, it's a really nice setup, so I'm hoping you'll get a lot of great results in the future as well. So I have a couple of questions uh, about the experiment. Um, so with uh, that's the well, you saw that there is some certain heat. The heating from the bottom produces some dramatic effects on the vortex lattice. But then, so if does the uh, heating produced by the laser light have any effect? Because, uh, well, presumably laser light is absorbed by the particles and that uh, creates like a source of heat. Yes. Uh, so um, this we can try. We can, I mean, we, we, we've we tried experimentally, I would say. So uh, to give you numbers, for example, uh, the for now, most like 95% of our experiments we used uh, laser power of 500 milliwatts. And, uh, but the laser itself can go up to 10 watts. Okay, so we can multiply by uh, 20. We didn't went to 10 watts, but uh, what I can tell you is that uh, you see no effects on the images, or at least the images I showed you here, uh, be, uh, before going to a power that is, I don't know, I don't remember, but far higher, far, far higher than 500 milliwatt, maybe, maybe two watt or something. Uh, and we did that on a quiescent flow, okay, where, where you see particles going up because there are hydrogen particles, so they have a tendency to go up slightly. Um, on, on second order, uh, <laughs> this is the main answer, but second order, I, have, uh, I can also confess that at the end of the day, of a, an experimental day, okay, we have particles that have been uh, that would deposit on the walls mm -hmm. of the of the channel of the inside channel, okay, and this generates uh, eventually uh, reflections. So it's not the particles that are inside the flow, okay? Mm -hmm. They are too little, I think. This is as simple as that. But when they accumulate on the wall, then they diffuse a lot, as you said, and there something happened close to the walls. I can uh, I can confess you that. And uh, even at relatively low power, in fact. Uh, so we have we have observed that we are still trying to understand it. And maybe actually it would be a way to play, <laughs> to force something, to force a flow by, uh, by I don't know, playing with, the, we can also modulate the laser light power yeah. and try to play with it uh, like this. Right. For well, now, it's not, it's not uh, let's say it's not a um, priority, but because uh, we are happy with uh, our protocols. But uh, this is also why I, uh, I spend some time to explain that every day we start with a fresh, with a fresh experiment. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I think uh, well things would be a bit different because those deposited particles uh, would be a problem. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Excellent and uh, good luck. So I think Andre Golf has a question in the chat. Yeah, I can I can read it out. Um, I don't know if you're there, Andre. I, I don't have the chat. Uh, I can read it out. It's fine. Yeah. Um, so Andre just asks, I wonder how your values of the critical heat flux and the creation of the vortex tangle compare with the earlier work of Swanson et al. from 1983. Yeah, this is clearly our reference. Uh, Let's talk about it uh, soon. Uh, I don't. Well, we we have this reference in mind, of course, uh, and I cannot answer. Uh, I mean, it's not that I want to hide anything. It's just that it's not quantitative enough to be shared. Uh, but uh, we will work on it. We know this. Um, um, this reference. It's coming. It's coming. Coming and uh, yes. It's well, orders of magnitude are, are in the same range. That's the first, uh, first quick answer. Uh, and but I would like to be more precise. 
Okay, thank you very much, Matthew. Oh, nice images. <laughs> thank you. So, if there are no further questions, if the temperature is very different, Wego is right. But uh, hopefully, we will be able to vary that too. Here we are. So, if there are no further questions, um, well, first of all, can we can we all thank Matthew again uh, for a very interesting talk and for for dealing with quite a lot of questions um if philippe is still here can i invite him oh he's yeah. popped it in the in the chat so uh, you can see philippe is just placing a, an advertisement for an upcoming workshop and summer school uh, in corsica and registrations opened and there's a link in the chat And Philippe, just to say, I'm happy to email that out to, to all the mailing list as well. Sounds like a good plan. And Philippe says thanks to this forward. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's where we'll finish today. So as I mentioned at the start, our next webinar is in three weeks' time um, on the Tuesday at 4 p.m. UK time. Um, and it'll be given by Nils Anderson, who was in the audience. I don't know if he's just gone from Southampton, who will be talking about superfluidity in neutron stars. So look forward to seeing you all then. Yes. Thank Great. you again to everyone. Thanks for your question. And um, do not hesitate to uh, contact me if you have further questions or further suggestions. That's great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.